So when you guys see the gi, you know what that means. We're about to do some black belt Bible reading tips. Now, before we jump into this video, if you haven't already subscribed, what are you waiting for? Seriously, at 10,000 subscribers, which we're getting pretty close to, we're gonna be giving away the entire Anchor Bible Dictionary set. This was donated by a scholar friend of Disciple Dojo's, and I thought this would make the perfect giveaway to celebrate hitting 10,000 subscribers. But we're not done. Our goal for the year is 20,000 subscribers. We're about halfway through the year, so we're gonna need a little bit of help at the end to make that final push for 20,000. So if you have not already subscribed, just tap the little subscribe button at the bottom of your screen and tap the notifications icon. That lets YouTube know you're interested in Disciple Dojo. You wanna know when we have new videos out, and that's how you can keep track of the different giveaway contests that we do periodically here on the channel, including our next one at 10,000. Also, for those of you who train martial arts or just like to work out, do yoga, you're into fitness, whatever, over in our Disciple Dojo online store, we have rash guards, workout shirts for sale. We've got flip-flops so you can not have to walk into the bathroom with your nasty feet and then get back on the mats because nobody wants to be that guy. We have stretchy yoga pants if you want to work out or just lounge around and go to the grocery store in. T-shirts, coffee mugs. We've got all kinds of stuff over in our online store. So check it out. Every purchase you make helps support this ministry and helps us keep going. And the biggest way to support Disciple Dojo and help keep us going by far is becoming a monthly dojo donor. We rely on donations for everything. We are entirely donor funded as a nonprofit ministry. So if you appreciate this channel, if you've learned, if you've grown, if you've been stretched, if you've been challenged, if you just like the fact that there's biblical teaching, in-depth study Bible reviews, ridiculous superhero seminary videos, all of the things that we do here on the channel, if you like that and you wanna support it, the best way you can do that is by becoming a monthly dojo donor at whatever amount you're able to afford, a few bucks or much more if God's blessed you in that way. We rely on our viewers and we rely on our donors. Without you, none of this would happen. So thank you to those of you who have supported the channel, who have subscribed, who've donated, who've picked up stuff from our store. None of that is unappreciated here at Disciple Dojo. Okay, with that out of the way, let's look at seven black belt tips for reading the book of Deuteronomy. So tip number one, understand how important this book is. Deuteronomy has been said to be the most influential book in both testaments in the entire Bible. Gordon Fee and Doug Stewart make this argument. The words of Deuteronomy have influenced all of the historical books in the Old Testament and are quoted over 80 times in the New Testament. Christopher Wright says that Deuteronomy is the heartbeat of the Old Testament. And we know that Jesus thought Deuteronomy was of supreme importance because in the wilderness, when Jesus was being tempted by Satan, if you remember that story, Satan quoted scripture at Jesus three times. And each time Jesus responded by quoting scripture back to him. And we think, okay, well, Jesus knew his Bible. But when Satan quoted scripture to Jesus, he was quoting from the Psalms and the prophets. Every time Jesus replies to Satan, he quotes Deuteronomy. And even cooler, the general location where this wilderness tempting is taking place, the wilderness across the Jordan, that's the very spot that Deuteronomy was given in. Deuteronomy are the words of Moses to the people of Israel looking across the plains of Moab over into the promised land on the other side of the Jordan. Israel had been tested in the wilderness and they had failed repeatedly. And when they got into the land, they'd be tested again and would fail repeatedly. Jesus, in that scene, the gospel writers portray Jesus as taking the destiny of Israel on himself and succeeding where corporately the seed of Abraham had failed time and time again. So it's not coincidence that every time Jesus quotes scripture back at Satan at the beginning of his ministry, as he's preparing to be the Messiah to Israel, he quotes Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy is incredibly important. One of the foundational books of the entire Bible. It's a shame that so many people skip over it as they're 
looking to get into the historical books. And this dovetails into tip two for how to read the book of Deuteronomy. Recognize it for what it is, that it is the hinge between the historical events of the Torah and those that would come later in the history books. So you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then you have Deuteronomy right there in the middle, looking back at those events, recapping them, putting them in their covenant context. And then you have Deuteronomy looking forward into the events of Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and predicting what the outcome of those historical events are going to be. So Deuteronomy is this hinge document. It looks backwards and it looks forwards, right there at the beginning of Israel's national history. Now, this brings up tip number three in reading and understanding Deuteronomy, is having an idea of its authorship and the issues surrounding its authorship. See, Deuteronomy in such detail predicts what's going to happen in the coming centuries in Israel that a number of scholars in the 18, 1900s, early 20th century said this had to have been written after the fact. Deuteronomy had to have been compiled and then found, discovered during periods in Israel's history where they were trying to reform the nation and shore up power in certain groups that were vying for control. And so Deuteronomy is presented as if it were the words of Moses, when really it's talking about the events of like the 6th century BC, hundreds of years later. Now, that's a common view you'll read in biblical scholarship. But it's important to state right at the outset, Deuteronomy itself makes an entirely different claim. Deuteronomy itself claims to be the words of Moses. Now, whether Moses actually wrote the entire book, that's up for debate. There are good reasons to think Moses was not the final editor, redactor, responsible for putting the book into the format we have today. There were probably layers of editorial editions. We see that through passages where it talks about such and such as it is to this day, implying that there's a span of time between when Moses was alive and when the book was written, or at least in its final form. We have the account of Moses' death at the end of the book, and the phrase that he was the most humble man on the face of the earth, those don't sound like something that Moses himself, no matter how great a prophet he was, would have been able or even inclined to write down. So it's very unlikely that Moses was the final author, editor, compiler of the book as we read it. However, contrary to claims of many documentary theorists out there, the bulk of Deuteronomy fits well within the second millennium BC. That's prior to 1000 BC. And this brings us to tip number four in reading and interpreting Deuteronomy, recognizing its setting in the second millennium BC. Scholars have long recognized that the structure of Deuteronomy, the book overall, has a lot of similarities with ancient treaties. And particularly, some have compared it to ancient Neo-Assyrian treaties. However, there are certain aspects of those treaties that you don't find in Deuteronomy. And what you do find in Deuteronomy just happen to match the form of treaties that come from earlier in the second millennium BC, specifically Hittite suzerainty treaties. The whole book of Deuteronomy is structured according to these treaties. And we know the structure of these treaties because we found copies of many other examples. In Hittite suzerainty treaties, you would have a great king, a suzerain, that's what that word means, and the suzerain would make a treaty with the vassal. So it would be a people group or a city-state. So you had the suzerain, the great king, the great ruler, and the vassal. And when they entered into a treaty agreement, there would be a covenant made between these two peoples, between the suzerain and between the vassal. And the covenant would be written down. And so in these ancient Hittite suzerainty covenant documents, what you find at the beginning is a preamble, like just a beginning. Here's what's happening with this covenant. And that's exactly how Deuteronomy begins in chapter one, verses one through five, the preamble. Then the next part of the Hittite suzerainty treaty covenant would be the historical prologue. So the historical prologue would give the background why we're making this covenant to begin with. What are the conditions? What are the events that led to us making this covenant between this great king and his vassal state or people? 
And the historical prologue would tell that story. It would recount the great things that the great suzerain had done for these people and why they're entering into this covenant with him. Well, that's exactly what we see in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 6, all the way through chapter 4, around verse 43. Then the heart of the covenant, sort of the heart of the treaty, the whole purpose, would be for the great king to give the vassal stipulations. Here are, we would say in modern terminology, the terms of the contract. Here's what you have to fulfill. Your obligations are, you'll give me this much in taxes, you'll support me when my enemies attack, you'll give me these goods from your storehouses, you'll whatever, whatever. The stipulations, the rules that the great king would lay upon his vassal people would be spelled out in the body of the treaty. And that's the bulk of what Deuteronomy gives us as well. In chapter 4, verse 44, all the way through chapter 27, the stipulations, this is how you are going to live as my vassal people. Then in Hittite suzerainty treaty covenants, you would come upon a section that lays out the blessings that would be bestowed upon the vassal if they kept the treaty stipulations. And right after that, and usually much longer, you would come upon the curses for breaking the covenant treaty. Breaking a treaty in the ancient world, a suzerainty covenant treaty, was a matter of national treason. And in order to deter clients, vassals, from doing that, the suzerain would include all sorts of horrific and terrifying language, calling down curses from all the different gods, cursing every aspect of their society. It was to terrify the people. So the blessings were, hey, if you do your part, then this is going to be amazing. But if you don't do your part, and if you rebel against your suzerain, it's over. And once again, we see this same structure in Deuteronomy. The blessings in chapter 28, verses 1 through 14, and then the horrendous, cringeworthy, hard to even read sometimes because they're so terrifying, curses in verses 15 through the end of the chapter. So this is stylized writing. There's a reason that these curses, that this punishment, that it, that it seems so severe. That's part of the genre of this type of writing. This is national covenantal language dealing with national rebellion. Then in a Hittite suzerainty treaty, there would be a calling forth of witnesses. The witnesses for many ancient treaties would be all of the various gods of both peoples because the vassal may have their own gods that they worship and the suzerain may have their national gods that they worship. So all of the gods would be called together to witness this covenant, this binding agreement. And we see that in Deuteronomy 30 as well in verses 19 and 20. Only there are no other gods to witness it. Instead, God calls heaven and earth to witness it. Creation is the witness the mountains, the hills, all of creation is the witness between the great heavenly suzerain, Yahweh, and his covenant vassal people, Israel. Then, in ancient Hittite suzerainty treaty covenants, two copies of the covenant would be made, and they would be deposited in the respective temples or government centers of the two peoples. So, in the temple of the suzerain, back in the home country, there would be a copy of the treaty, and for the vassal, they would receive a copy of the treaty that they would deposit in the temple of their God. And periodically, the treaty was to be brought out and reread nationally so that all the people knew this is the covenant that we live under, under the great king. It was repeated periodically. Well, that's what we see in verses 24 through 29. We see God saying, make two copies, not two tablets with the first five commandments on one and the second five commandments on the other. That's how it's portrayed in movies and cartoons. No, the two tablets had the whole covenant and the covenant was written and both tablets were deposited in the ark, in the tabernacle among God's people. Why? Because God was not a faraway suzerain who lived in some other country. God was the king of Israel, but he lived among his people in their midst as the whole book of Leviticus lays out. So both copies were kept in the tabernacle in Israel and later the temple because that was the national seat of power for the vassal Israel. And it was the throne of the great suzerain Yahweh himself. So we see that Deuteronomy, the whole book, 
is structured according to or very much in line with ancient suzerain treaties from the second millennium, not from the first millennium. It has some similarities with first millennium suzerainty treaties, but it really reflects second millennium suzerainty treaties much more. And everything about Deuteronomy, except for some minor additions and things like the as it is to this day or Moses' account of his death, things like that, you always can allow and account for later editorial updating of certain biblical books. But the bulk of Deuteronomy is thoroughly at home within the period of the Exodus and shortly after. So there's no compelling objective reason to date Deuteronomy to way later centuries because literarily it fits right in the second millennium. And knowing the structure of Deuteronomy and that it is intentional will help you as you're reading through the book to not see it as this haphazard rambling collection and not just a rehashing of some of the stuff in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Rather, it's specifically crafted and structured in a very particular way. And that speaks to unified authorship. There's also a great bookend at the end where just like Genesis ended with Jacob blessing his sons who would become the tribes of Israel, speaking to their futures and what's going to happen, Deuteronomy ends the same way with the Song of Moses, where he lays out what's going to happen with the tribes of Israel. So Deuteronomy recapitulates literarily what happened at the end of Genesis. But instead of a little family of about 70 or so people, now you have this vast nation on the brink of heading into the promised land, showing the fulfillment of the original Abrahamic promise. So having an idea of the structure and the literary layout of Deuteronomy, super helpful because genre matters. And that brings us to tip five for how to read Deuteronomy. In addition to being like literarily structured around the basic outline of a second millennium Hittite suzerainty treaty covenant, Deuteronomy itself, the sections themselves are written with a much greater degree of emotional pathos than you find in Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers. In the law books of the Torah, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, the laws are laid out, not quite, but almost dispassionately, at least in comparison. Whereas in Deuteronomy, you are hearing Moses' heart. Moses, the lawgiver, takes a back seat to Moses the preacher, Moses the prophet, Moses the exhorter. Moses speaks incredibly emotionally when you read through Deuteronomy. Sometimes that emotion is anger. Sometimes that emotion is sadness. Sometimes it's frustration. Sometimes it's longing. Sometimes it's awe and joy. You get all the ranges of emotions. And it's important to realize that when you're reading Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy got one of the most unfortunate names in the entire Bible. Originally, it was called Devarim. And that comes from the first sentence of the book. These are the words, Devarim, that Moses gave to Israel. But later when it was translated in Greek, the passage where it says make two copies of the covenant or two copies of the law, that got interpreted as make a second law. And so somewhere along the way in the Greek translation and then coming into English through the Latin, Deuteronomos, second law, became the title of the book implying that, oh, this is just repeating the law for the second generation that was born in the wilderness whose parents died after they came out of Egypt. So this is just repeating the law. And therefore, Deuteronomy a lot of times just gets skipped over because, well, we've already read this stuff in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. But that's not what Deuteronomy is. Devarim, these are the words that Moses spoke. Moses is preaching Moses is exhorting, Moses is pleading with Israel, this new generation, the generation that did not see the events of the Exodus for the most part. Joshua and Caleb did, maybe a few others, we don't know. But the first generation as a whole that came out of Egypt, they're dead in the wilderness. That all happened in Numbers. This is that next generation, the second census in the book of Numbers. These are the ones who are now about to go from wilderness traveling, tent dwelling shepherds to living in the land, inhabiting Canaan, fulfilling the promise that God made to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 15. So when you're reading Deuteronomy, don't read it as, oh, well, these were just laws. Read it as this is Moses preaching the law. 
the laws that were given in Exodus and that applied for that whole generation while they were in the wilderness, now it's time to move into the promised land. And so the laws are going to get recast. And the vision of the law, the purpose of the law, the entire reason for the covenant is going to be laid clearly before the people. And there will be some things that will be different from how they were given in Exodus because that period of the wilderness wandering is over. That generation is dead. This is Israel 2.0, if you will. And so Moses pleads with them and tells them, this is what's going to happen because I can't go with you in this land. You're going to be in the hands of someone else after I'm gone. So Deuteronomy is Moses' farewell address to his people. And when you read it that way, it reads differently than just reading a collection of laws. And this brings us to tip six in how to read and interpret and understand Deuteronomy. Moses' vision of what Israel's future will entail. Like we said, it's so specific that some have said this has to have been written after these events happened. Because he talks about Israel rejecting the covenant. God punishing Israel, calling them back time and time again. There being a king, that's something that would happen way later in the future. The people being given over to idolatry, wanting to be like the gods of the nations around them, and ultimately those nations around them carrying them off into exile and seemingly destroying God's people and everything that the covenant stood for. This is all in Deuteronomy. Read chapters 28, 29, and 30. And Moses then looks even beyond that to a time when God will renew the hearts of his people. That after their disobedience, and it looks like everything's done, God will do something new in his people in such a way that involves the phrase circumcising their hearts. And that somehow, and it's not spelled out in Deuteronomy, but somehow God will bring his people back to him after they have repented and turned to him, in their being scattered, there will be a national repentance. There will be a turning, a softening of the hearts. And his people will once again turn back to him as their suzerain. Now, this is all depicted at the end of Deuteronomy. Like I said, chapters 28, but really 29 and 30. This is important because for the early church, this was part of the gospel. This was explaining why so many supposed Israelites, Paul's kinsmen according to the flesh, as he puts it in Romans 9 through 11, why so many of them were still rebelling against God's covenant, which they believe had been inaugurated in Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. And so Paul will look to Deuteronomy 29 and 30 as he makes his argument in Romans 9 through 11 about why it is that Israel as a whole seems to be continually rebelling against the Messiah, but yet a few, a remnant within Israel, which Paul includes himself in and the followers of Jesus, are remaining faithful and even Gentiles are coming into the faith. And so Paul will look to Deuteronomy and see the future that Deuteronomy predicts. And that's how he will wrap up Romans 11 with this notion that in the end, all Israel, Jew and Gentile together, all Israel will be saved through this grafting in of broken off branches, as well as wild branches from other trees into the root, into the trunk, into the tree, which is the people of God, ultimately symbolized by the Messiah. So at the very pinnacle of that section, Deuteronomy 29 and 30, it's laid out chiastically, and right in the middle is the key verse that sums it all up. Yahweh your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your seed or your descendants or offspring so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. So this is the promise that Moses looks forward to even after the rebellion, even after the captivity, even after it seems like there's no hope. Well, that same promise Paul picks up on once again, in a chiasm in Romans 9 through 11, the entire section is laid out in a chiasm. And the middle chiasm of Romans 9 through 11, right there in chapter 10, is all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so what Paul is doing is looking to the structure and the promises and the gospel in Deuteronomy and then explaining it in light of the events of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, sending of the Holy Spirit, and this massive influx of Gentiles into Israel. 
So this is what leads scholars of Deuteronomy, like Daniel Block and Christopher Wright, to say Deuteronomy is the gospel in the Old Testament. Most Christians today, we think of it as law. Second law, Deuteronomy. Okay, let me get this over with. And that's the complete wrong attitude when we're reading it. But how do we know this? How do we learn all of this stuff? Well, that leads us to what's always the final tip in these Black Belt Bible Reading Tip videos. Tip number seven is get good resources. Get good, solid resources that help you dig deep into the book of Deuteronomy. Get a good study Bible. We've reviewed over 50 study Bibles here on the channel. You can look through some of those for my recommendations. For my money, the best one on Deuteronomy is still, and this is a custom binding, so you can't really see it, but it's Zondervan's Archaeological Study Bible, not Crossway's Archaeology Study Bible. This is not in print anymore, unfortunately. I keep saying it in videos where I mention it. Zondervan, you got to bring this Bible back in print. It's so good and especially for the books of the Torah, and especially for Deuteronomy. So if you can get your hands on a copy online somewhere of the Archaeological Study Bible, it's fantastic. Or I would recommend something like the Cultural Background Study Bible, or even the Life Application Study Bible, though it won't give you as much of the history as the first two would. And there are other great study Bibles out there, but get one that you can read and understand. So pick a translation that makes sense to you and read Deuteronomy in that translation, reading the study notes in whatever study Bible you have. But don't stop there. I want to point out three commentaries at ascending levels of technicality that you should be familiar with. The first is Christopher Wright's commentary on Deuteronomy. Now, this is in the old NIBC series. The newer one is same content, but it's just printed as part of a series called Understanding the Bible. I'll put a shot on screen so you can see. That's what it's gonna look like if you order it from Amazon or you find it in a Christian bookstore. If you come across this one though, this is the same commentary. So that's the main thing, Christopher Wright and the book of Deuteronomy. This is, anybody can read it, it's not technical. And I literally spent months using this commentary as my daily devotional reading. That's how he writes. So if I could only recommend one commentary on the book of Deuteronomy for everyone, no question, this would be it without a doubt. In addition to Wright, I've mentioned before, Daniel Block's commentary on Deuteronomy. Now I got to spend a day with Daniel Block uh, shortly before this was published, after he had finished working on it, but before it had been published, I was looking to possibly do a PhD under him. And so I went up to Wheaton. We spent the afternoon together. He could not have been more delightful and more gracious. And the thing was, he had just finished this commentary and it was about to come out. So we talked a lot about Deuteronomy. And if you could have seen the excitement and the passion that he had, I mean, his eyes would light up talking about Deuteronomy as gospel. Deuteronomy as preaching. And so he wrote the volume. It's in the NIV application series. This is written not for technical audiences. You don't have to know Greek or Hebrew or anything to read it. It's written with a mindset of not only what does the text say back then, but what are some things we can apply from it today? So again, like writes, this makes for just as good devotional reading as it does commentary study. So if you already have Wright's volume, this would be the second one I'd say put on your list. And the third one that I want to point out is Peter Craigie's commentary in the NICOT series. This one is a little technical. It's not super thick. I mean, for a commentary on Deuteronomy, it's fairly small. It doesn't get bogged down in the technical arguments, but it does interact with some of the technical scholarship. There's discussions of the things like the authorship and the structure of Deuteronomy and all of that stuff. So if you are at the level where you want something a little more technical, you wanna interact with the Hebrew text some, you wanna get into more of the scholarship of Deuteronomy, then I think Craigie's would be a good entry into the book at that level. Now, there are so many other great resources on Deuteronomy that are out there. I just mentioned a few in these videos because we don't wanna overwhelm, but the important thing is that you read the book, read Deuteronomy, understand what you're reading to the best you can and let it absorb into your mind. Let Deuteronomy become as familiar to you as the Gospel of John or Luke or the book of Acts, because that's what it is. It is, it is gospel. It is the story of Israel as a people. It's prefiguring and laying the groundwork for the new covenant. 
That circumcision of the heart thing is going to be picked up on by prophets like Jeremiah in chapter 31 or Ezekiel in chapter 36. And that's then going to be laid out in the New Testament, especially in Acts 2, when they look at the events of Pentecost and say, what is happening? What's going on here? Finding in Deuteronomy, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Joel, the Psalms, finding the message of Scripture to have been there all along, just being fulfilled in a way that nobody was expecting. So I hope this video helps you at least as you start to set out and read the book of Deuteronomy. Like with the other books of Torah here, Disciple Dojo has an entire playlist where we walk through chapter by chapter the whole book of Deuteronomy. We spend a year studying it in 30-minute sections. It's available here on the channel, or if you prefer audio, podcasts, listening on your commute or while you're out walking the dog or whatever you're doing, you can check it out over on Disciple Dojo's podcast page as well. It's called Deuteronomy, the heart of God's people, because Deuteronomy as a book is sort of the heart of the Old Testament, and Deuteronomy is about the heart of God's people. God wants their hearts, not just their outward actions. So thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more Black Belt Bible reading tips here at Disciple Dojo. And once again, if you haven't subscribed already, we would really appreciate it if you do. Help us continue to keep growing this channel, and as always, keep training. Thank <laughs> you.